We should be going live. We are live. Welcome back. Happy Friday. I guess today's the 24, 21st of August. Michael Lofito, this is our 39th Luxury Lunch and Learn. We launched this on April 10th due to COVID-19. We want to bring relative information, content, uh, experts on to keep raising the bar in real estate. And I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to have today's guest on. Uh, before I introduce Tom, again, if you guys have any questions whatsoever, uh, if, you, if you like the content, please share it. Please uh, you know, share it with others. But uh, we definitely want to continue to bring the, the value to you and raise the bar. So uh, with that being said, this is our 39th Luxury Lunch and Learn, uh, the previous episodes can be found on our YouTube channel. You can go to Marketing Luxury Group and um, you'll find the previous 38 episodes. If you know someone that would be a great guest, please, by all means, uh, you know, nominate them, send me a private message. And uh, with that being said, I have a, an exciting guest on today. As many of you know, I'm the founder of the Luxury Listing Specialist designation for real estate agents. Uh, we, uh, provide agents with tools, resources to raise the bar, to attract more opportunities. And I have the founder of this CNE, the Certified Negotiation Expert uh, designation, and the founder of the Real Estate Negotiation Institute. Uh, and I have Tom, Tom Heyman uh, here today. Tom, welcome. Thanks for being a guest. Pleasure to be here, Michael. Thank you. So, you know, uh, I actually have your designation, CNE, Certified Negotiation Expert. You know, as a real estate agent, you want more arrows in your quiver. When you go on appointments, you want to differentiate yourself from the competition. And I took your course several years back with an amazing instructor, Wayne, uh, Wayne Pabraki, uh, does a great job. And um, so Wayne uh, was my instructor. And, you know, for negotiating, whether you're dealing with entry level or average price, clients or high-end and luxury clients negotiating is really vital and that's one of the things that doesn't always show up in the bio doesn't show up in your listing book and so being able to articulate and differentiate yourself and talk about both collaborative uh, negotiating and combative as well as disc personality and understanding personality types of negotiation is huge so uh, tell everybody a little bit about Real Estate Negotiation Institute and CNE and, and kind of how that came to fruition before we go into uh, negotiating and some other fun topics today. Be happy to, Michael. Uh, when, I got after, when I got into real estate, I had been in the corporate world for 25 years with the Procter & Gamble Company. I was in the global purchases organization, so we, we spent over $23 billion a year on the goods and services to make over 300 products worldwide that Procter & Gamble sells. So we had to learn how to be very good negotiators spending that kind of money. So I was very fortunate to get trained at Harvard and at Wharton and at Oxford University in England. <clears throat> and my, when I uh, retired from Procter & Gamble in 2001, I got into real estate in 2003. And I did so because I knew my negotiation skills would be beneficial for my client. And they were, but uh, I'm based in, um, Peoria, Arizona, which is a suburb of Phoenix. And when I went through my 90 hours of pre-licensing training, there wasn't one minute spent on negotiation skills. And subsequently, I learned that no state gives any training on the professional negotiation skills in pre-licensing, nor is there any requirement after you get your license to take that kind of training. It happens to be the number one skill that clients look for. And and it's not just a business skill, it's also a life skill. So think of negotiating as persuading or influencing others to agree to something or to do to something. So because it was lacking in real estate and I really thought it was necessary, I put together training for my brokerage at the time and got very good feedback. I then expanded it and started teaching other agents here in the Phoenix area. And at the end of 2006, I put together the Certified Negotiation Expert Designation um, Program, which was a two-day class. And it deals basically as four uh, building blocks, the, the basics of negotiation for those who have never uh, been taught anything. We start with that. Then we go into the two basic styles, competitive versus collaborative, and we talk about how Harvard says you actually have to be both, use both styles in the same negotiation to get the best outcome. 
Uh, another way of thinking about it is you have to be both cooperative and assertive to get the best outcome for your client. And so we talk about the characteristics of those styles. We talk about the different tactics, especially the competitive tactics and how you would defend yourself against those. And we go through a segment that shows what skilled negotiators do differently from average negotiators, which is very key. Then we go into our second building block, which is all about buyer psychology, how buyers make a purchase decision is both right brain and left brain. You influence the right brain differently than you do the left brain. Um, all of this is also is tied to your value proposition that you as an agent present to your client. So we talk about features and benefits um, that you have to be able to articulate to your client in the same language the brain is using to make a purchase decision for your services when you're trying to get hired. The third building block are seven scientifically proven persuasion principles that increase the odds of success. It doesn't guarantee it, but it can increase it dramatically. And we have over 100 scripts with uh, one or more of the persuasion principles um, for real estate negotiation situations that we go through. The fourth building block is simply a planning tool, a three-page planning guide that helps you proactively plan your negotiations before you get into them. And then we have case studies to show how it all comes together. And we end with a big role play at the end of day two in the in-person class um, to give you some practice. So that was our certified negotiation class. And then we realized there were other topics we needed to include. So we created the master certified negotiation class, again, two days. And it includes uh, more advanced negotiation techniques on the seller side and buyer side of the table on day one. On day two, half the day is spent on written negotiations, email negotiations, texting, which we don't recommend to negotiate. Um, but written negotiations are the most difficult negotiations. You get poor results, you get more hostility, more threats, more ultimatums, and we do it a lot in real estate. So learning how to negotiate in writing is a skill that we need to perfect. And then the, the last half of day two is looking at cultural and generational factors um, in real estate negotiation situations. So many cultures teach hard bargaining approach to negotiating. You start aggressively high or aggressively low. Nobody takes it personally. It's just the norm. Um, we, we teach you how to deal with these different tactics that are more from the hard bargaining uh, mindset as well as generational factors, especially on communicating um, from millennials all the way up to older baby boomers. So those are the two courses that we have. We've, uh, we've done it now since 2007 and we have over 70,000 students. Over 70,000? 70, 70,000. Yeah, and, and you have instructors across the country, correct? We have over 20 instructors uh, right now that cover the country. Of course, with Zoom, which we're doing our classes now, um, we can cover places we haven't been or we don't have instructors in at the same time. Okay, good. I was going to ask you, how has the COVID world with live training affected you? Of course, you and I have talked offline, so I know, but, but you said more and more Zoom training. So your typical live two-day class, talk to me about what does that look like online today? Great question. Online, the research shows that we aren't made to look at a screen for hours and hours a day. So seven, eight hour classes, which I know are out there, hour classes, um, you're just, your brain is too worn out towards the end of that to really process anything. So our uh, Zoom classes are three days. And for the C&E class, it's typically four hours a day, uh, 10 to 12 in the morning and one to three in the afternoon. And the MCE class, because you, you typically get 12 CE hours with our CE class, Okay. With the master's class, it's usually 15 C &E hours, or yeah, okay. sorry, CE hours, and we do five hours a day, okay. uh, three days for them okay. to, to, to not make it wear, wear you down. Yeah, okay, so same number of hours, but spread out over three days versus two. Yes, and the feedback from the students is very positive because it does leave them time to do uh, work if they have to. Well, you know, one, I, I use the word uh, elephant in the room or with like the hotels.com, Captain Obvious. Uh, one of the things you talked about is cultural differences with negotiation. And without going into details, you know, the code of ethics and, and realtors uh, with discrimination, you got to be really careful. Uh, you know, I'm sure for you and your instructors, how you cover that. But uh, talk to me just in a general term, you know, that the factual information that is that certain cultures like you said, 
uh, communicate maybe differently, but also negotiate differently. And that's, has that been scientific, historically proven? Yes, and, you know, there's some great resources out there. The Kiss Bow or Shake Hands book has some excellent um, country by country uh, negotiation information. Most of the literature out there when you're talking about cultures is when you go to another country and you're in their culture to negotiate and how they do it differently. What we focus on is um, in many of the larger cities, I teach a lot in Houston, very diverse city, Phoenix sure. very diverse. So you've got lots of different ethnicities and there are some unique factors in terms of the way they negotiate, but many cultures around the world are what I referenced earlier in terms of hard bargaining tactics is what they've been taught from a very young age. And, and they grow up with it. They conduct themselves that way. Nobody so, picks so they go, they go, they go to the open market. They go to the market to buy food, you know, exactly. and they're asking, you know, whatever for the apples, they can negotiate, uh, you know, on the apples, they can negotiate on the fish or the meat. And that's just part of their culture. Well, here, you know, what they, we ask at, at, at Mariano's or, or one of these supermarkets, Walmart, you're paying the price, but there they negotiate pretty much on, on a lot of things in the open market. Is that fair to say? Absolutely, it's exactly what happens. If um, I, I worked in uh, Japan for four years with Procter & Gamble and ran our Far East Purchase Organization, we had operations in 10 different countries. So I went to all those different cultures. The one common aspect they had in all of them was that they're a relationship-based culture. And to really negotiate effectively with them, you need to show that you care about them and their culture, and you have to abide by their local rules. In Japan, I found out that uh, before I could negotiate uh, effectively with our Japanese suppliers, and including some of my own Japanese purchasing people, I had to do two things. I had to go out and sing karaoke with them. And while I was singing karaoke, I had to drink either beer, sake, or cognac. They're all three. And, and nobody cares how well you sing. They're very polite. As soon as the song stops, uh, everybody starts clapping, no matter what kind of job you did. Other cultures in Malaysia, if you showed the uh, sole of your foot to the other party on the other side of the table, that was the biggest insult you could make to them. So investing in relationship became very important. So the same thing is here. If you have if your client is from a different culture, it's just relationship based, which is typically the Far East cultures, you need to ask about the family, invest in the relationship, spend time in small talk or talking about them to show that you truly care to build trust with them. Now, the tactics that are used typically uh, are the same tactics from different cultures, different countries, but same tactics. So it doesn't really matter where the tactic comes from, which culture, it's how do we handle it as a, as a professional negotiator. So in some cultures, the serious negotiations don't start until the contract is signed. Then they start to renegotiate the key terms. Here in the United States, once you sign a contract, it's like you're, you're, uh, you're done and you just execute, unless you're a professional athlete and you have one good year and you wanna re renegotiate. So we have to teach how do you handle people who want to continue to negotiate after they've signed the agreement, where it's completely normal for them the way they were raised. That's a, that's a great point. You know, you're a seller, you know, you got a price that you're happy with. And, you know, many times the buyer wants to renegotiate because of inspection issues or, you know, the, the market changes or, you know, they want to get the last say in, right? A lot of, a lot of people feel like they got to get the last word in or, hey, they, they won. They wanted that lawnmower included or whatever it might be and you didn't at that price. And then, you know, they, they ask for it after the fact or, or some buyers are the same way. So uh, that, that's, that's a great point. Our own, our own contract um, really encourages that because the real estate transaction is a series of negotiations. And so after the buyer and seller agree on the initial terms, typically the next negotiation is the repairs from due diligence because it's built into the contract that way. Then if the appraisal doesn't come in, right, you have another negotiation there and usually getting to closing, something comes up that has to be negotiated. Final walkthrough, something didn't get done or they're not happy with it. And, and if I felt that I didn't get everything I wanted or I wasn't treated quite fairly in the beginning, I have opportunities to try and make that up later on in the process. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. 
Great point. Well, let, let's uh, let's move. So great insight. Again, for those that are watching this live or on the replay or in the various Facebook groups, uh, we're, and we'll go on, but where can they find out more about uh, CNE and the, and the Certified Negotiation Expert designation, Tom? The, our website is uh, theready.com, T-H-E-R-E-N-I.com. The R-E-N-I is Real Estate Negotiation Institute. So www.theready.com. Uh, all of our class schedules are on the website. Information about both CNE and MCNE testimonials, how to get a hold of us is all there. All right, perfect. Now, when we're talking luxury real estate, uh, I, again, I found that many agents compete by by lowering their fee. And I teach agents, of course, to bring more tools and resources and more value to the table. So you are more valuable as an agent or broker. You're more referable. You differentiate yourself from the competition. And you don't have to be the cheapest agent because sellers, if they see value, especially high net worth individuals, they pay more for their dining experience, their cars, whatever. They, they might not beat you up on fee if they see the value. Uh, before we go into multiple offers and, and stuff, you, you, you and I have talked, uh, you know, built relationship over the year. And, and we, one of the things you talked about is maybe if a seller does beat you up a little bit over fee, how as an agent, as a broker, again, check with your broker owner if your office allows this, but you might be able to tie in a, a performance bonus. Talk to me a little bit about that. Be happy to. The, the mindset I came into real estate with was my corporate experience. So in the corporate world, executives would typically have a base salary, and then when they get to a certain level, they get a bonus based on profits of the company, because at, at that level, you potentially can influence the profits. So it's in your self-interest to help the profits be as large as possible, so you get your bonus. And then when you get a senior executive levels, you get stock options. So um, the mindset that we can be incentivized through uh, our compensation plan is just a human nature truth. So when I got in real estate, I was a little surprised that we were kind of put into a box of uh, what we could charge, depending on the brokerage you're with. So uh, when sellers would want to negotiate their, the fee, listing fee, if they wanted to go down, we teach the exchange principle, concession making and taking, I'll give you that if you give me this, you always give first, because if you give somebody something, there tends to be a sense of obligation created that they owe you something in return, because you gave them something first. Right. So if I say, if the seller says, I only want to pay you X percent, and it's lower than what I want, I would say, all right, well, if I agree to take the listing at that fee, would you be willing to allow me the opportunity to earn a performance bonus? So at first I asked for agreement and concept. And what I find, Michael, is that people who, clients who have only worked on a dollar per hour wage rate or a straight salary, no additional compensation, they don't relate as well to incentivized compensation plans, but executives who are on those plans, salespeople who are on commission, they understand that if you, you, if you can get more, you'll probably work harder for it. So then I would say if the seller says, well, potentially I might be willing to allow you to earn. I always say to earn. I don't want to think that I'm just going to be given the bonus. Sure. Then they would say, well, what, what do you have in mind? So one of the bonus programs I have is I had a seller, Bob, and um, after I comped the home, that he had tried to sell for sale by owner and he wanted me to sell it as his daughter's home. Um, I agreed to give him a his daughter a discount because of his past client. But I said to Bob, I, I know you want to make um, your, your daughter as much money as possible. And I, I gave her a discount. Would you be willing to consider a, a bonus plan for me? And he said, sure. What do you have in mind? He owned his own business. So I knew he thought right. And I said, well, how about we do this? Um, if I sell it over this price, we split that amount over that price. And he, right away he said, that sounds fair. And it, the price was higher than what he had tried to sell his daughter's house for. So it wasn't like I went lower than that and was right. gonna uh, do something unethical. Um, so when somebody says that sounds fair, the fair way 
to split something, most people would say is 50-50. So I said, Bob, how about we split the difference 50-50? Uh, he said, fine. So the first offer we got um, after putting the house on the market Thursday afternoon, Friday morning at 10 o'clock, we had a full price offer. So I said to Bob, I said, good news, full price offer. Here are your options. Number one, you can accept the full price offer. Your daughter will net X. She'll be happy, you'll be happy, and I'll be happy for you. But I wasn't happy because I didn't get a bonus. So I said, but your next option is you could counter back over full list price, and here's why you would want to think about doing that. And I said, you haven't been on the market for the first weekend yet when most buyers come out. This is a very strong seller's market. Worst case, I think, at the end of the weekend. Worst case, I can't guarantee it, but you'd have multiple full price offers. Best case, you're going to have over full price offers, but it's your choice. Whatever you want to do, Bob, I'm fine with. And he said, uh, okay, let's counter back. How, how, how much higher should we go over full list price? I said, the risk is the higher you go, that buyer may walk away. Right. So we talked it over and uh, the, the price was two, 205, uh, was the full list price. So he decided to count back at 210. And uh, it was literally 30 minutes later, the buyer's agent called me back and I explained to him why my seller was doing this. He wasn't trying to be um, dishonest or unethical. It was just the way the market was. And the buyer's agent called me back and said, my buyer agrees, 210 is fine. At final walkthrough, I was, uh, I was there as the listing agent with the buyer and the buyer's agent. And I just had a conversation with the buyer and said, I uh, hope you don't think we we're being unreasonable. It's a strong seller's market. Um, my buyer you know, had some pretty good second options. So I hope, hope you understand. And he said to me, the buyer said, that's fine. My next best option was 220. And, and I got this house for 210. And my first thought was, did we say 210 or, or did we say something higher? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought we said 220. <laughs> yeah, I thought we said 220, but, yeah. but it just shows that that was a one example of a bonus. One, an agent in Seattle, Washington shared with me her listing uh, normal plan. She's normally a high-end agent. And she said, I charge a 6% fee up to a sales price of 600000 and anything over 600,000, I get 10%, not 6%, but 10%. So when you do the math in every situation, she's more motivated to sell as high as she can over 600,000 because that's how she'll make the most amount of money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so you can come up with different bonus opportunities that are actually a win-win both for the client yeah. and for the agent. Yeah, win-wins are, are huge, uh, again, uh, if you bring value to the table, don't be afraid of what your value is worth um, at the end of the day. So that's a really good story. I appreciate it again for those agents, brokers watching. Um, check with your broker owner. Every state's different. Definitely. All right. So we are in a, a seller's market in many markets. It's hard to believe that you know during a pandemic uh, there would be such a strong uh, real estate market. I mean, interest rates are ridiculously low. There's a lot of people uh, moving out of these major cities because you can work from home, work remote now, or, or you know, violence and and all the other stuff that's going on. So, talk to me a little bit about multiple offers. Many agents, uh, where they represent a buyer or they represent a seller, they're not comfortable or they don't have the experience uh, negotiating in a multiple offer situation. So talk to, talk to me a little bit about what do you guys teach at the Real Estate Negotiation Institute? I, I love this question because from a background of Procter & Gamble, we were um, often the largest buyer of what we were buying in the world. So we had leverage, but we had a competitive bidding process that we used on typically commodity items where we had lots of suppliers who could meet our uh, quality specifications. And we would send out an invitation to bid. We would say first bid, last bid, no negotiation. Here's what's important to us. And we gave them specific feedback about what we were looking for. And I'm a firm believer that in real estate, the listing agents should do the same. If they're going to say, give us your highest and best tomorrow at five, or if they start off by saying, um, which I've done, uh, put the home in the, in the MLS at Thursday at, uh, afternoon, and I'll say, we're accepting all offers till Sunday at five and the seller reserves the right to negotiate with who he wants to. I want to be very specific about here's what the seller is looking for. 
So either meet or exceed these to have a chance of um, winning. And I've had up to 33 written offers. And, and I, I, what I see now in real estate, as you mentioned, Michael, the two most common topics that I see being written about are coaching, number one, and multiple offer situations, number two. So we've just, um, we're putting the finishing touches on what we call uh, a series of uh, real estate uh, negotiation institute negotiation guides. And the first one is multiple offers. Uh, it's a 25 page document on how to plan and negotiate multiple offers, both from the buyer agent standpoint, what are the things that your buyer can do to make their offer more attractive? Right. We have 17, we have a check, these uh, guides have checklists that you can use with your clients to make sure you've thought through all the different options. Oh, that's awesome. As well as worksheets that explain some of the terminology um, that may not be common across the country. But the buyer multiple offer form is a document checklist and worksheet you can take your buyer through to say, here are the options you have. It's your decision. Here are the pros and cons of you doing this versus doing that to increase the odds. Also guidance on presenting your buyer's offer because we're a firm believer based on scientific evidence that if you could present your buyer's offer face to face to the listing agent and seller, you will do a much better job than the listing agent will in presenting the buyer's offer. You have a chance to build rapport. You have a chance to get information. And every time I presented face to face, except once I got my buyer, the off the home, even when their offer was not the highest priced offer. Interesting. So, if you can't present face to face, and we know with COVID it's very difficult, the next best option is for the buyer's agent to do a video presentation. Uh, five to seven minutes is all it really takes typically to present your buyer's offer. We have a recommended format and what you should say and what you shouldn't say. And you, you would send the video um, link to the listing agent asking them to make sure the seller saw it. The way, best way you can guarantee, try to guarantee the seller will actually see it is to reference it in an addendum to the purchase contract. So the seller sees it and then would go to it and take a look at it. That's, that, that's a great idea. I'm huge in video. So again, face-to-face -face is best, but obviously when COVID-19, that might even be more challenging, depending if, you know, the, the seller's at high risk or the buyer. Uh, but video, you know, you could create a video on your smartphone. You can do a, a desktop video. You got bomb bomb videos, email videos. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's great, Tom. The, the most effective communication includes words, voice, and body language. So when you're face to face, it's your words coming out of your mouth. It's your voice, including tone, inflection, and rate of speed. And you can use your own body language and observe the other side's body language. Mm -hmm. That's why face to face is the best. Or video, live video, you can do the same. But when you, you are presenting a video, making a presentation in the video and sending it, at least it's your words, your voice, and your facial body language. Right. Um, you can't see the other sides, but that's better than a phone call where it's only your words and your voice, but no body language, far better than written negotiations where it's your words on a piece of paper, somebody else's voice in their head, emphasizing different words in front than you would if you were making the presentation and mm -hmm. no body language. So very, very videos, number one choice, always, or live. Yeah. That's, that, that's, those are some really excellent tips. Now, is that checklist uh, for buyers and, and sellers that you reference? is that gonna be for sale? Is that something that uh, people can purchase or, or talk to me about that? Uh, two ways they're gonna be able to get it. Number one, it's gonna be given as a bonus at our classes for the rest of the year, included in the registration fee for our classes. So when you see the marketing for our class, you should see bonus multiple offer guide. Uh, and within um, two to three weeks, we will have it up on our website for sale for a very, very reasonable price. The idea is a lot of people either don't want to sit through a two-day Zoom conference to get the training that we give um, or don't want to pay the fee or don't have the money for that. So we want to give bite-sized chunks, if you will. Think of them as chapters in a book where, where there is specific uh, focus on a situation in real estate that we can provide our negotiation advice for, and then they can buy it chapter by chapter by chapter at a very reasonable price. Oh, that's, that's great. Well, the, I, I mean, looking forward to uh, when that's released, so keep me posted. I will let you know. So you yeah, know that's, uh, that's huge. Um, 
you and I had talked about, we don't have all the details, but you and I talked about maybe doing something together in October where agents could, uh, through online, um, they can go through your course and get your uh, CNE uh, uh, designation as well as our LUX designation. So uh, we'll be releasing some information about that. You know, keep an eye out, uh, those of you that are on my group or in my groups, uh, keep an eye out that you can always go to luxurylistingspecials.com, luxurylistingspecials.com and click on the event tab uh, in, in the header there and that list all of our events. But keep an eye out for that. And uh, we're looking forward to, to working along with you guys, Tom. Hey, Michael, um, I tentatively picked the dates of October 20th, 21st and 22nd. Okay. And I'll send you a discount code for your viewers. It will give them a hundred dollar discount off of our price. Oh, great. Excellent. Well, uh, we will circle back and we'll of course let everybody know in our database and uh, through online as well about that upcoming training. Cause uh, again, letters on the business card are one thing. It's what do you do to leverage and differentiate yourself? I'm a big believer that uh, a certification or a designation means squat means nothing unless you take the knowledge, you take the networking, you take the resources, and it helps you bring more value to your clients and you differentiate yourself. And that's really what we teach agents. We teach brokers. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to do some stuff with you. Uh, we are too, because it's such a good fit. Um, the way I think about it, Michael, I know your sons play baseball, correct? Correct. Yeah. So um, if you think, use baseball as an analogy, the, the general statement is the bigger the game, the bigger the skill set needed to play at the, the bigger games. So baseball starts off with tee ball, where the ball is sitting on a tee and they, it's not moving. And then they progress to an underhanded, usually throw, and then they overhanded slow fastball. Yep. And then Coach progress. pitch. I'm sorry? Coach pitch, like not Coach pitch, yeah. right? And then player, player pitch, yeah. And then, and then as you move up through the uh, levels, you've got a faster fastball, really fast balls, and you've got curveball, really big curveballs, you've got sinkers, sliders, knuckleballs. When you get to the big leagues, you've got to have a bigger skill set to be able to handle all of that. Same is true in real estate. So the high end and the luxury end of our market, that's where the bigger skill set is needed. And you, you have to know how to negotiate with those kinds of clients that are very different in many ways from other clients. Yeah, you, you bring up a good point. Again, for those agents and broker owners that are looking to break into or, or dominate selling high end and luxury, you know, understanding the mindset of that successful C-level executive uh, for a communication standpoint, also from a negotiation standpoint is vital. And that's really why I wanted to have you on. I was strategic uh, about having you on now uh, because uh, A, that luxury market is much stronger and, and, and and agents might see multiple offer situations. You know, I'm selling a million dollar property in the suburb I live in of a former uh, major league baseball player. And we had four offers, uh, right. which is unheard of. We haven't seen that for luxury in, in the Chicagoland suburbs in 15 years. And so understanding all the things that I've learned through Wayne and CNE and you and just 20 years in the, in the industry was vital where some agents, um, you know, you get what you pay for. And, and unfortunately, they, they might not have been able to bring a meeting of the minds of both parties. And as you and I have talked, Michael, the, the three skills that I think agents can focus on that will get the biggest return for their business are marketing, market analysis, and negotiation. And you teach in your book, to such a great book at the luxury level, on marketing and market analysis. Mm -hmm. which we, we teach market analysis as well. And then the negotiation uh, all throughout the transaction. It's just such a nice package for agents to show their clients that they've invested their time and their money to get a higher skill level to benefit their client. Yeah, absolutely. Being that specialist and, you know, my tagline, it's not the market, it's the marketing, right? So again, how do you present home. I'm actually going to be putting on a $7.25 million home today. And I talked to a buyer's agent who had been through this home with the previous agent. I sent him the photos already. And he said, man, the way you've positioned this home is such more effective. And so that's really what you want to do. Uh, the way you package, the way you present, uh, the way you uh, negotiate is vital uh, 
in a buyer's market, but even more so in a seller's market, uh, because again, you're leaving money on the table for your client if you do a poor job. If I could just add, um, if people want, if, you, if your viewers want to view a website called maxavenue.com, Max, Max. Max, it's uh, Harold Ware, um, started the brokerage um, years ago, but he's a high-end uh, type of person. He owned a, his own architectural company and he sold it at age 40 for millions of dollars. He retired, moved to New Zealand, spent two years living on the beach in New Zealand, decided there had to be more life than this. Came back to the United States and used the same principles um, that he built his architectural business with and put together a process for selling homes and buying homes for agents to use with clients. So he's very big on pr his process. And he brought me down to teach the CNE class years ago, twice to his group, and he had 160 agents at each class. And I learned very quickly that one instructor handling 160 students is a real challenge from a question standpoint, comment standpoint, and time management standpoint. But you go on that website, you'll see some of his agents saying, one woman spent 20 years at, at IBM. And she said, I learned at IBM that to be successful, you had to have the right process. So what you and I have tried to bring to real estate is the process of negotiation and the process of luxury marketing. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. And I think those processes are so key to have them in place and know how to execute them to get the results that you need. Yeah, I mean, everybody's looking for this button in, in real estate, right? And in life, unfortunately, easy button. And and it, it doesn't exist, right? And, right. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that, uh, you know, real estate's got a big churn rate. You know, everybody watches HGTV, million dollar agent. They think it's easy. But if it were easy, everybody would do it, right? And so um, there's a natural you know, we, we uh, leaning out, I guess, the herd thinning of the herd, as Dan Kennedy used to call it. And uh, it's not easy. Uh, you, you got, you could write a book, you're a social worker, you're a psychologist, you're a negotiator, you're, you're a friend, you're a, you know, all these things to, to a client. It's a very emotional process. Uh, life is what drives real estate, Tom. People are moving because they're getting away, they get promoted, they're unfortunately divorcing, their, their family's growing. Uh, financial distress, whatever it might be, but it's one of the most stressful things people go through. So be a good listener, uh, be empathetic. You know, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, Tom Thomas uh, Kamen once said, people would rather do business with someone they like and they trust, rather someone they don't. Even if that likable person is offering a, a lower quality product or service at a higher price, let that sink in. So I teach agents to offer a higher quality product and service and be likable and be empathetic. And so it's a win, win, win. Yeah, Stephen M. R. Covey's book, uh, Speed of Trust is what we use in our c &E class to focus on how to build trust quickly. But he, his book is a tremendous book on research about trust-based relationships. When I was at Procter & Gamble, I actually was put on special assignment to develop a process on how we would build trust with suppliers. And all the research shows trust-based relationships get better results in faster time. So it's worth going through the effort to learn how to build trust quickly with your clients. We don't, we don't want to have a long time to build trust. We don't want three or four years to work with a client to build trust. It's got to be quicker. Yeah, people look for you know, the, the instant results, the, the sprint. But sometimes in real estate with builders and developers or high net worth individuals, it, it's the marathon, right? I just talked about this with a developer recently. I mean, it's taken years. I put a $3.5 million home on last week. I've been talking with the seller for three years. Most agents will get frustrated and move on. But just staying in communication, again, people buy and sell on emotion and they justify with logic. And so buyers are not always on your timeline as an agent and sellers are never on your timeline necessarily either. So just be likable, you know, bring value, stay in communication with them. Uh, again, one more time, the Real Estate Negotiation Institute, the Rennie, R-E-N-I, the Rennie.com. Uh, appreciate your time today, Tom. And uh, anything else you'd like to add? Um, I do, I want to make the point that in the, uh, Covey's book on trust is, calls it two dimensions, uh, character and competence. And it really kind of hit me when I read it. Character is a constant in all relationships. You have to have high character to be trust. 
competence is a, a variable. And I always say to my classes that I believe all of you are trustworthy and I would trust your character until you prove me otherwise. But I would not let any of you operate on me because you don't have the competence, you don't have the training. So competence includes your skill development, which is your marketing, um, luxury marketing designation, Michael, and ours for negotiation. The evidence of those that you can show clients gives them a reason to trust you and your competence based on your training and the results you've gotten for others. You can get and repeat that for them. So I didn't with that. It's, good. it's a great way to think about trust. That's awesome. Well, again, you've been watching the 39th episode of Luxury Lunch and Learn. If you, if you like something, please share it. Again, you can check out our, our YouTube channel, uh, Marketing Luxury Group, where we have replays of the previous 38, ep 38 episodes, or you can go to our Facebook group. Uh, again, check it out, Luxury Listing Specials. I'm your host, Michael Lafito. Make it a great day. Keep raising the bar in real estate. Uh, again, the ne negative news. The news wants to divide us. Again, build each other up. Don't label, don't, you know, don't treat others differently because how they vote or if they don't vote your way, just build people up and more and more love and, and prove others wrong. Have a great Friday and take care. And Tom, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Michael. I enjoyed it. I appreciate it.